gracious love on us and chose us to be saved. This fleeting life is passing by with all its joys and pain. But we believe to live is Christ and death is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. truth remains we will not fear we're unchanged to live is Christ to die is gain and though we pray for those we love who fall asleep in Christ we know they'll see and see into his eyes so now we clear what we don't breathe as those who have no hope for just as Jesus rose again he'll raise us home to live is Christ to die is gain in every age this truth see the lamb once slain who saved a countless multitude to glorify his name we're yearning for the wedding feast of jesus and his bride his nail-scarred hands will finally bring us to his side to live is christ to die
the life and faith of our sister and the Lord, Cindy Adams. It's times like these, it's good to remind ourselves of the unchanging character of our God. Listen to the words of Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Will you pray with me? Lord, we confess that you indeed are righteous in all your ways and that your ways are higher than our ways as your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We praise you that you are a God who cares and comforts. You are near to the brokenhearted. You save those who are crushed in spirit. You are near to all who call on you, to all who call on you in truth. You are perfectly just in preserving those you love. Your mercy is so sweet in the gospel of your son. Even in this time of deep sorrow, sadness, and mourning, we still have confident hope in your son, our Lord Jesus, who overcame our sin and death through his sacrifice on the cross and his victorious resurrection. May he be preeminent in our hearts in the next hour. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to me how great
then I shall bow in humble adoration. Another Old Testament reading that's been selected for today is Psalm number 116. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish, and then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, and my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. What follows are some reflections that I have on the life and faith of Cindy Adams, whom Janice and I knew for 32 years, and whom we deeply loved, as did many of you here. As part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught, as recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and this is the way the old King James reads, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. At the First Baptist Church downtown about three quarters of a century ago, the teachers in the Sunday school class for the youngest children, the one just out of nursery, those teachers decided that they needed to teach the young boys and girls to memorize scripture. But they knew that at that young age, some of those verses were too long and the old King James Version, which everybody used back then, was a little complicated in its verbiage. And so those teachers shortened some of those verses at times and um, rearranged some of the phrasings, gave a capsulized version. So the, 
the longer King James Version of Matthew 7, 12 came out as do unto others. Do unto others. And that's what my classmates and I memorized. Do unto others. And then later they had us memorize the first part of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, which says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. And then another time, just so that we would know that such behavior was Christ-like, they had us memorize from Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus went about doing good. The teacher's aim, of course, was not just that we would memorize those things, but that we would live them out in practical and sincere ways. The doing part didn't catch on with me till many years later. But those long ago memorized phrases from those now familiar verses came back to my mind in the last couple of weeks. As I thought about what to say today about my dear sister, Cindy Adams, she was kind to others. She was tender hearted. That's what God had put in her, a tender heart. And like her Savior, Jesus Cindy went about doing good. Her life was characterized by doing unto others. One of our leader brothers prayed with the family just before we came out and was praying about Brian and Cindy and their ministry and service, and he used the word constantly. And that was what Cindy did. She constantly was doing for others. Jesus himself said to his disciples in Luke 22, I am among you as one who serves. What a Christ-like example and emulation Cindy's life was. She served others in so many ways, so many times. Many, perhaps most of us in this room today have been served by Cindy. Some of us again and again and again. Janice and I have known Brian and Cindy since 1990 when they first started attending this church. Uh, I was at the time the teacher of the Sunday school class of their age. And after they'd come several weeks, we asked them to go out for a meal one Sunday and uh, just to get to know them better. And <clears throat> we did the typical get to know talk. <clears throat> you know, why, why are you thinking about looking for another church and why this one? And all was going well. And I was thinking, you know, if the Lord were to lead this couple to this church, they would be a really good addition to our church body. And then almost at the end of our time together, Cindy said, there's something else you need to know about us. And my heart sank. I've heard that before. There's something I need to tell you. And I thought this is not going to be good. I'm concerned for what was coming next. And knowing I needed to hear it, I said, what's that? And Cindy said, Brian plays in a band, and we ride a motorcycle. <laughs> and having personal experience with both of those things and figuring the Lord was probably okay with that, I encouraged them that if he was leading them to come here, you just come on, and I think you'll fit, fit in well. And, and you join with our church, and you come and, and grow and worship and serve with us. Serve with us, oh my, did they? Soon enough, the Lord had Brian quit the band and start using his musical skills and talents as our worship leader, which he's been doing for many years now, and serving in multiple other ways. And Cindy served in our church, oh, I don't know how many ways she served us, um, for years and years and years. Served in the nursery, served on our missions team. She was involved in the children's Sunday school class. Countless other ways of serving to individual persons and, and families in our church. Um, as well, she used her accounting skills and abilities to, for a number of years, as a stateside representative for a missions organization uh, in Italy. She oversaw their financial things. Um, she also served and invested in her nieces and nephews as they were growing up. Um, lately, especially serving mom and dad in various ways, um, ministering, 
ministering, ministering. I'm telling you, look up in the spiritual dictionary the word servant and probably see Cindy's picture right there. But let me tell you about one particular event of ministry that most of you probably don't know about. In the late 1990s, the Lord brought a couple from New York to come to our church for several years while the husband went to a graduate school at CIU. Uh, Christopher and Rebecca Giroux, that was Christopher playing the violin over here earlier, and our friend Jane from Kentucky was accompanying him on the piano before the service started. Um, while Christopher and Rebecca were here, they became friends with Brian and Cindy, and, and when the Giroux's moved um, early in the 2000s to go to Cincinnati, and they've been there ever since, the Adams and the Giroux stayed in touch with each other, and um, we visited a time or two with them. The four of us drove up and visited with them. Um, several years after that move, when Rebecca was pregnant with her fourth child, there were some pretty serious complications. She had several other physical things going on, and her doctor told her, Rebecca, you need help. You need to be on bed rest. And you can't handle these other three children and all the housework you got to do. You need to be laying down. Who do you know? If you got a parent or an aunt or somebody in your family who's able to come and help you? And the answer was no. Nobody was either able or, 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 or capable of doing all that. The doctor said, well, it's got to be somebody. And Rebecca said, I know a lady in South Carolina who could do that. And I would trust to do that. So Christopher called Brian, who said he would check with Cindy and see if there was any way that could happen. Of course, Cindy was working full time back then for SCNG. Soon enough, Cindy had taken days off of work, vacation days, bought an airplane ticket, flew to Cincinnati, spent a week or 10 days there, caring for the other three children, doing laundry, cleaning, comforting Rebecca doing what needed to be done on her vacation. And Rebecca's testimony to me even yesterday was, Cindy brought calming and healing to me and to the situation. To those of you who knew Cindy, I asked, doesn't that sound just like her? That's her. It was the Lord who made her the servant she was. Yes, she had good upbringing. And Mr. Ms. Wilkie, we thank you for raising your daughter the way you did. But the Lord Jesus Christ conformed Cindy more and more into his image as a servant. And she emulated that beautifully. We all know that Cindy was kind and tenderhearted and that she loved children. Sometimes she and Brian would keep in their home the some of the church children when their parents needed a date night or a long weekend away. In the past few years, Cindy taught the toddler, one of the toddler Sunday school classes, and she loved those children, and they loved Miss Cindy. One of her nephews had some particular physical needs, especially earlier in his life, and Cindy got some special training so that he could come and stay with them sometimes and, and give his parents time to go other places and do other things and they would take Nicholas to concerts and all kind of things like that. You all know that Cindy was quick to smile and to laugh. And especially in the last several weeks, from many people in this church in different contexts, even men, I heard the word I kept hearing used was sweet. Cindy was sweet. And she truly was. She had a sweet voice and a sweet disposition and the man who knows her better than anybody on earth, her own husband, says she is the sweetest person I have ever known. And she certainly was one of the sweetest people I've ever known. So sweet that at least one time that I'm aware of, her sweetness caused her to speak an untruth. So let me explain that to you. On the Monday evening before the Lord took her home, at one point, my brother Paul Cummers and I went into the room to visit with Brian and Cindy, and it was just the four of us in there. And uh, Cindy's breathing was labored, but 
When we walked in, she knew who we were. She called us by name. She smiled. She always smiled. And she smiled at us and thanked us for coming. And Paul uh, knelt down by her bedside and read some scripture and, and prayed with her. And we talked a little bit more. And then Cindy said to Brian, let's sing a song. And that's something they'd been doing. And Brian had some, some of their favorite songs on his phone. And so he, he pulled up a song. Uh, and she said, I would like you all to sing for me. And uh, it happened to be a song that Paul and I knew, we knew the words to. And so the music started, and about two-thirds of the way through the first verse, Brian's emotions cracked, and he kind of trailed off with his singing. And then I heard him say, right before the second verse, you said, this is your favorite verse. And so the second verse starts, and Brian can't get a word out, which left <clears throat> Paul and I to continue to sing. And sing on we did. And when it was over, Cindy said very softly, thank you, that was good. <laughs> it was not good. It was awful. <laughs> just, it was just terrible. Uh, we gave it our best, but we were emotional too. And it sounded like a couple of coyotes howling a praise chorus at the moon. But sweet, kind, tender-hearted Cindy thanked us and whispered, it was good. It was the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ in her life and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that made Cindy Adams the sweet, kind, tender-hearted, loving, Christ-like woman that she was. I want you to know that it was Jesus. One of the blessings that I had for knowing the Adams for so long was watching God mature her into the spiritual woman that she became. Brian and Cindy and Janice and I have done a good bit of traveling together over the years and gave us a lot of opportunity to have conversations of all sorts of things, including, of course, spiritual matters. One of the most helpful things I found in dealing with Cindy was talking to her, counseling with her. She was so open and honest about her feelings and even about her struggles. In those early years, when Janice said I knew her, city would struggle at times with spiritual insecurities, sometimes just feeling not as strong as she wanted to be in, in doctrinal matters. And she would be, would be honest with us about that and say, I'm struggling and I don't understand this. And she would ask questions and she would listen and then she would go study and, and learn. And, and for several years in those early years, she and Janice spent time together, many months, uh, discipleship, relationship. Because Cindy wanted to grow spiritually. And in addition to what Brian was teaching her, what she was learning on her own and and learning here at the church from the preaching and teaching, she wanted to, to get a, a woman's perspective on some of the biblical principles. And so they studied together and God grew her. Those days of her spiritual insecurity were so long ago that I had to work at remembering them in the past few days to, to say what I'm saying right now. The Lord grew her so much, so much. And it was a privilege for me to observe as her friend and her elder up close over those years how Cindy worked at learning the Bible better and knowing God better. And then what she learned, she began to transfer to other women. It was so beautiful. And God honored that. He, he grew her from her uncertainties into a confident woman of God. A loving woman, sometimes even boldly, sweetly, but surely and boldly speaking God's truth to people who needed to hear it. And all of us here who knew her are beneficiaries of her spirituality. Now, all of these true things that I'm saying about Cindy, and by the way, she would not be happy with so much attention being put on her. I know that. But all of these things that I'm saying about her kindness and her tenderheartedness and her love for others and her servant heart and her servant actions and her Christ-honoring spirituality, and I didn't even mention her being a beautiful Christian wife to Brian. 
All of this was because of Jesus Christ. Because of what he had worked in her and how he worked through her. And Cindy would want everybody in this room to be very clear about that. That her Lord gets all the credit and all the glory for her becoming and being the wonderful, beautiful person that we knew her to be. And she would want me to say to you, will you look to Jesus in faith? Will you love him? Will you live for him? The Lord Jesus makes all the difference for now, for all eternity. I have Brian's permission to share this beautiful and poignant true story that he recounted to me last week. On their very first date, Brian was 14 years old. They went to a Valentine's banquet at, sponsored by their church at a, a place in the small town where they grew up. And uh, since Brian was too young to drive, Dad drove them to the banquet and waited. And when they got done, he took them home. And they're on the way home. And Brian's sitting in the back seat with Cindy. And all the way home, Brian's trying to get up the courage to hold Cindy's hand. All the way home. I'm just going to say it like you said it, Brian. Dumb me couldn't get up the courage to do it until they turned into Cindy's driveway. Brian said it's about 45 seconds from the road up to their house. And finally, I got the courage to reach over and I took her left hand and my right hand. And she let you do it. <laughs> and I held her hand up to the house. And I got out and walked her to the door. And that was the end of our first date. After some years of dating, after 34 years of marriage, on Wednesday evening, July the 6th, 2022, Brian was again holding Cindy's left hand when Christ called her into his presence. We bless God for everything he did in their lives between those two hand holdings. Amen? Amen? We do. And I bless God for the privilege, the honor, the blessing of being Cindy Adams' friend. One of the Puritan pastors from the 1600s, Mr. Ezekiel Hopkins, wrote this. Heaven is where the unveiled glories of the deity shall beat full upon us and we shall forever sun ourselves in the smiles of God. <laughs> Beautiful. Heaven is where the unveiled glories of the deity shall beat full upon us. And we shall forever sun ourselves in the smiles of God. We bless you, Lord, for taking our sister to be with you there forever by your grace. Through the faith you gave her to believe in your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow.
the evening Dennis referred to where we sang so wonderfully together. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> what a gift from the Lord to spend those few minutes together. We did laugh together. We certainly cried together. We prayed together and sang. And although our sister's body was very weak, her voice was but a whisper, her countenance was absolutely radiant. Cindy knew that she was facing her final enemy. She knew that, apart from God's miraculous intervention. Yet, there was no fear in her eyes. Only peace. She would, on occasion, look over at Brian, and she would smile that sweet smile, but there was no fear. Her mom and dad came across the hall from where her mom was at the time, and she was comforting her parents. She had the peace of Jesus all over her face. Her smile was that signature Cindy Adams smile that we will all remember and cherish. Why? Why at that moment was she so filled with confidence and hope and assurance and even joy? Why? It's because she knew and believed and had set her hope on and in the Lord Jesus Christ, who inspired the Apostle Paul to write what we're about to read together. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. Hear the word of the Lord this afternoon. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, family, friends, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord our labor is never, ever 
ever in vain. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are precious to us. You were precious to Cindy. And she loved you with all of her heart and soul and might and strength. She had joy and peace and confidence that night, all through her life, right up until the moment you called her home because you were hers and she was yours. And she had confidence that what we just read was absolutely true. There was no doubt in her mind that you are good, that you do good, that all your ways are perfect, that all your words are right, that all your works are just. And so she smiled. <laughs> Not because of who she was, but because of who she knew you to be and because you indwelt her. And so we give you thanks, God, that we can shout, Behold, O death, where is your sting? You have been defeated. You were defeated at the cross, O enemy. And one day, for all of us who know you and trust you, Lord Jesus, we will rise again. God, I pray that you would be my brother's comforter and hope and courage and strength and peace and joy at this moment and in the days and weeks to come. And now, Lord, as Pastor Ryan brings your word to bear on our hearts, you through the conduit of our shepherd, come, O oh Jesus, come, O oh Spirit of God. Use your life-giving, your light-giving word of God and do miraculous things today. Breathe new life into any here who don't know Jesus and who could not on their deathbed be as joy-filled and as peace-filled as our sister Cindy was. God, I pray that you would do above and beyond all that we could ask or think through the power of the risen, reigning, returning Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.
Speaking at Cindy Adams' funeral is really challenging. And speaking at funerals can be challenging for a preacher because sometimes the person is so unknown. Other times, in Cindy's case, they're so well known and there's so much to say about her life that honored Christ. And thankfully, Dennis did a great job at that. But we all have our Cindy stories. I think of a few of my own. First night we moved into Columbia and uh, we didn't have our possessions yet in our house. We had to stay with Brian and Cindy. Brian, you remember this? And at first it was supposed to be a 10 p.m. arrival and got stuck in Nashville traffic, which pushed it back to midnight and then a few bathroom breaks. It's 3 a.m. by the time we arrived. Cindy and Brian were faithfully awake to greet us. I fell fast asleep, found out a week or two later that Cindy stayed awake the rest of the night because she was concerned about our U-Haul pull-behind trailer that somebody might break into it. Again, just a testimony of her quiet, sacrificial love. I could share with you about how Cindy, the entire time she was sick, faithfully participated in every one of our mission team meetings because of the heart she had for people and other nations who had yet to believe in Christ. And how she faithfully prayed and labored and pressed on. I could share about how Brian's testimony is that Cindy never complained. He never once heard her complain the whole time she was battling cancer. And when I heard that, that was so convicting of all the trivial things I complain about. So I could share with you on and on. I could take my 20 minutes to share with you all the great things about Cindy. But then I can hear Cindy's sweet voice in the background reminding me it's not about me. It's about my Savior. Make much of him. 
And so that's my job in this short time. I want to make much of Jesus. I want to look at a passage that makes much of Jesus because the most important part of Cindy Adams' life, although her service was so beautiful, and we thank God for it, we thank God's grace and how it worked in her heart over years and years and years, conforming her into the image of Christ, the most important part about her life was the Savior who loved her. And that's what I want to celebrate in this time. In this brief time, I want to celebrate and make much of Jesus, particularly his precious love and his powerful gospel. We're going to look at the gospel of John, chapter 11. The story is Jesus and the resurrection of a man named Lazarus. And it shows us both the preciousness of Jesus' love and also the power of his gospel. So I'm going to begin reading. It's a very long chapter. We do have limited time together, so I'm going to kind of jump halfway in the story, starting in verse 32 of John chapter 11. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Let's first look at Jesus' precious love. In John uh, chapter 10, the chapter before this story here, Jesus speaks very lovingly, very pastorally about his love for his own sheep. How precious and how costly they are. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When we're talking about the precious love of Christ, we're talking about a Savior who shed his precious, costly blood to purchase sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. So whenever we read the next chapter, in chapter 11, we say, ah, we make the connection to say, he's talking about a guy like Lazarus. He's the good shepherd. He knows his own, Lazarus, and they know him. Lazarus was within that fold. So is Cindy Adams. She's within the fold, those who have been loved by Christ. Matter of fact, multiple times in this story, in John chapter 11, it's really thick with the love of Jesus for his own sheep. We see the love of Jesus highlighted several times. For example, in verse 3, whenever the sisters dispatch for Jesus to come because they know Lazarus is very sick, this is the way they call to him. The sisters sent to him saying, Lord. And they didn't say, Lazarus, our brother, he's ill. They said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Later on, whenever Jesus encounters uh, Martha and Mary in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Or, uh, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So friends, the first thing we see here in this story is the love of Jesus. That's what drives him to do all that he does for his sheep. And we know that love is a pretty central point of John's gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent his son to this world because he loved sinful, rebellious people enough that he would send his son to this earth to die for their sins. The topic of growing in God's love. And again, if we look at the sweetness of Cindy's life, why was she, she such a sweet person? Maybe some of it is how God wired her dispositionally, but she also had a tender love for Christ. It's expressed in Ephesians 3.19 when Paul prays for the church at Ephesus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
It's true of every growing Christian that they should know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And also seeing the last couple of years as Brian walked with Cindy through their cancer and the suffering and how Romans 8 talks about the love that even in the hardest times cannot break the covenant. Even the hardest times can't break the covenant love that Christ has for his own. Romans 8, 39, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But here in John chapter 11, we see it's real love, real concrete love in a story, a true story. We also see it's real love from a real Savior who took on a real humanity and is moved, broken, deeply mourns over the condition of his friend. Did you catch that in verses 33, 34, and 35? Whenever Jesus came and he, he sees the women weeping, the Jews who had come to mourn, he was deeply moved in his spirit. And then Jesus came and he wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, but so very powerful. And then Jesus said, so that, and then the Jews said about Jesus, see how he loved him. We see the raw emotions of Jesus, especially the fact that he cries. He cries. If you're familiar with Jesus, we tend to focus on maybe the miracles, the powerful things he does, the healings. But here we see him crying. Hebrews 5, 7 reminds us that Jesus sometimes weaved his prayers with tears. He cried out to God. We see this in his moments before he goes to the cross. He cries. Now, these last couple of weeks in our church family have been so very tearful. I mean, without exaggerating, I think we could take the collective tears from our church family, from Brian mourning, the Lord taking home his bride. We could probably fill this vase. There's been a lot of tears. But what do tears show us? What do they remind us of? What is the point in tears? Why has God made it so that we actually cry? Why did Jesus shed a tear? The first time we ever see a tear shed in the Bible is when a mother, Hagar, was afraid that her son Ishmael might die of thirst. And throughout the Bible, we see the same response whenever somebody does die. There's mourning, there's crying, there's weeping. A funeral is called, referred to in Ecclesiastes as a house of mourning. Somebody dies, and you can see it even here in the Lazarus story, that there's a lot of weeping and mourning over his death. Tears remind us of one reality. And that's what Romans 5.12 talks about, how just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The tears, especially the tears that we shed whenever somebody we love and is close to us dies, like we see in the story of Lazarus, like we see here today, the tears that are shed over the earthly loss of Cindy, do remind us that death has spread to all men. You can trace it all back to that one defiant act of disobedience from the first man named Adam in the garden, the perfect place of paradise. We can see how bad our sin and rebellion really is. Adam, Lazarus, Cindy Adams, your loved one, you and me, we all die. We all die. Every funeral that we come to predates our own funeral. That's why it talks about the house of mourning. It's better to go to a funeral than a wedding. If you were here yesterday, you would have heard the very same thing said. Because it's better to contemplate this fact that we're all going to die. We're all going to die someday. Falling ill is bad, especially when that illness is cancer and the battle is thick and severe. Losing a spouse of 34 years is gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching. These things cause a flood of tears, don't they? 
But friends, I want you to hear very carefully that there is something even more tearful, and that is being separated from God for all eternity. Because Jesus says in another place in the gospel that there is a place of perpetual, eternal weeping. We think that this is a sad day, and it certainly is. We mourn with those who mourn. We weep with those who weep. But imagine the tears being shed, even right now, being true forever. Because you're separated from God for all eternity. There's a place where Jesus says the tear will never be wiped away. That place of eternal destruction where those who without Christ go to. But there is a way out. And that's the second thing we want to see about Jesus. Making much of Jesus is making much of his love. But it's making also much of his powerful gospel. The powerful gospel. And that's really central to the story. First of all, Jesus has a clear purpose for everything that happens in this story. He's in total control. It's interesting that Mary subtly questions Jesus' timing in verse 32, the first verse that I read. When Mary came to where Jesus was in Solomon, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If your timing just lined up when he was more sick, this wouldn't have happened. If you just timed your visit differently, and sometimes the timing of how God works things is perplexing. And it takes faith to trust in his infinite wisdom and hold on to his goodness in those days. But Jesus' timing is here to highlight the power of the gospel in Lazarus' life. Further up in the story, in verse 23, Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is where we see the power of the gospel, the good news. That whoever lives and believes in Christ shall never die. Then Jesus, did you hear him? He asked what I think, I'm convinced, is the most important question to all of humanity. I'm going to ask you the most important question that you'll ever be asked right now, ever in your, the whole of your life. No one can ask you a more important question than the one that I'm about to ask. It's the question that Jesus asked. Do you believe this? Do you believe this powerful gospel? Do you believe a Jesus Christ, the one who has absolute power over death, has absolute power over life and death and over your eternal destiny? Do you believe? And if we need further convincing, well, what can he do that I should believe in him? Let's just finish out the story. Picking up in verse 41. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes. And he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you all, always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The story ends in this freedom, being set free from the bonds of death, being set free from the curse. It reminds us that when we heard it in the passage that Paul read, that death is the last enemy, but it is not the last chapter. That's why as Christians, we see the strange mix of joy and sorrow together. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Though you sow in tears, you will reap with shouts of joy. Why? Because death is the last enemy, but not the last chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. How is death destroyed? Hebrews 2, 14, since therefore children share in flesh and blood, have a humanity like we all do, that gets sick, where our bodies break down. 
where eventually, whether it's through a catastrophic accident or some illness that takes our life, we share in a flesh and blood. And again, one day we will all be at a funeral, and it will be our own. Since, therefore, children share in that flesh and blood, he, Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things that through death, He might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil. Death has been destroyed and defeated in Christ. And again, death is the last enemy, but it is not the last chapter. I'll take you to the last chapter, because this is the power of the gospel. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne. Notice, instead of a loud voice, instead of a tomb, now the loud voice is coming from a throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. For those who have faith in Jesus Christ like Cindy Adams. For those who have faith in Christ like her husband Brian. These former things will pass away one day. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and These words are trustworthy and true. They show us what the last chapter of this age looks like. And they give us hope. They give us hope, the power of the gospel. So friends, Brian's testimony was also that Cindy Adams was the sweetest person he has ever known. And that's a strong testimony when you have lived with the person for 34 years and you're not embellishing that. The sweetest person. And for many of us who knew Cindy very well, we also would say she may be the sweetest person I ever knew, or at least in the top three of the sweetest people we ever knew. And I agree with Dennis that if she was here, she would be so uncomfortable. She would be so uncomfortable. She would have wanted us to just sing and read scripture, and that's it. But we do want to honor the work of the Lord in her. She indeed was the sweetest person that many of us have known. But she would also be so quick to admit this very thing. That she was a sinner who was in desperate need of the Savior's grace in her life. She would be quick to admit that she has a Savior who has loved her in a precious way. She would be quick to admit that her only hope is in the power of the gospel. And now we can rejoice because she is experiencing the presence of her beautiful Jesus. And she would want any of you who don't know that to be invited to trust him even today. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for Cindy, her faithfulness and the testimony of that. Thank you for the Savior that has conquered death, who is risen, reigning, and returning to make all things new. We bless you and praise you. Amen. Church family, let's stand together. In Christ alone.
Christ alone was Cindy's hope and every believer's hope that the grave is not the end. There will be a graveside committal at Concord Baptist Church following this service in Leesville. There will not be a caravan processional, but the address is in here for those who want to attend. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving Cindy your grace to cling to your son Jesus until the very end. We give you thanks because we know that the spirits of departed believers in Jesus Christ are with you and are now delivered from the pain and burdens of this life and are in joy and peace. Father, we know that having finished their walk of faith, they now rest from their labors seeing Christ in whom they have put their trust and hope. We ask, Lord, that we ourselves might put our hope and trust in Jesus until the end, that we, with all those who have departed in true faith in your Son, may enjoy eternal life both in body and soul, in the presence of your everlasting glory and joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard our hope and govern our hearts by God's indwelling spirit, both now and until Jesus comes for all who have loved his appearing. Amen.